Welcome. It's great to see you all in a, a packed room here after last year. Uh, it was fantastic, by the way. I, I don't know how many times uh, I told my wife and kid over the last year of how great it is to be running a free market institute in West Texas. And I've been saying that for almost nine years working here now, but no time other than the last 18 months has it been more true uh, that we were at a university that allowed us to continue to have public events and stuff throughout the year. Uh, and we did the best we could through all that, but it's great to have a more normal one now with pack room and no virtual option or any of that other stuff. So welcome all, thank you, I appreciate you all coming out. Uh, I'm so pleased uh, with the guest that we have tonight, but before I introduce her, uh, I would not be doing my job as director of the Free Market Institute if I didn't plug our upcoming events for the fall semester as well. Uh, so next up on our agenda is Jason Brennan, who's going to be here in just a few weeks on September 30th, and he's got a message for the uh, money-grubbing students in Rawls uh, of why it's okay to want to be rich. Uh, he's a philosopher, a business ethicist at George, uh, Georgetown University who has a book on this topic, and he should be a lot of fun. And then our, our third event this semester uh, depends on uh, our government allowing the person to come to the country. Uh, but Matt Ridley is supposed to return. Matt Ridley is a member of the House of Lords in the UK, a best-selling author. And when I say best-selling, that's not like academic best-selling people. Like he's literally sold millions and millions of copies of his books. Uh, fantastic guy who works on the intersection of uh, biology, anthropology, history, archaeology, and economics. And he's going to be talking about his new book of how innovation works. Uh, and we were supposed to actually have him last year, but he wasn't able to come then. And Hopefully, he'll be here in early November for us for our third of these this semester. Uh, now, with those introduced, let me turn to tonight's event. I'm thrilled to have uh, Mary Anastasia O'Grady with us today. Uh, Mary writes the America's Column, a weekly column on politics, economics, and business in the Wall Street Journal that focuses on Latin America and Canada, so all of North and South America except us, except it relates to us. Um, she joined the paper in 1995. She became a senior editorial page writer in 1999. And she is also on the editorial board and has been since 2005. She's also a member of the board of directors of an organization called the Liberty Fund. And this event is part of a weekend long conference that we're doing co-sponsored with the Liberty Fund on liberal thought in Latin America. And having Mary and so many great scholars in town for this event, welcome to you all, by the way, who are coming from not just out of town, but out of country who, who made it here for that. Uh, it seemed like a great opportunity to combine that with a public lecture so that you could hear from one of our visitors for that. Uh, so I thank you, Mary, for pulling double duty on doing both of these things. Uh, Mary's an award-winning uh, intellectual and journalist. Uh, she won the 2012 Walter Judd Freedom Award from the Fund for American Studies. My personal favorite among these is in 2009, she received the Thomas Jefferson Award from the Association of Private Enterprise Education, which we now run out of our Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech. Uh, she also won the Bastiat Prize for Journalism, awarded by the International Policy Network for her articles on the World Bank, the underground economy in Brazil, and bad economic advice the US government often gives Latin American countries. Uh, she also won the Inter-American Press Association's Daily Gleaner Award for her editorial commentary. Uh, this is someone speaking in our series who's not an economist by training, although by practice she's better trained than most economists. Uh, her bachelor's degree is from Assumption College in English, and her MBA in financial management is from Pace University. And as Mary pointed out to me on the way in, my first, I guess, interaction, if we can call it that, with her was 11 years ago. Uh, in a column she wrote, I remember the title, it was called Columbia Needs an Irish Style Tonic, which to me meant a Guinness or a Jamerson, uh, but to her meant Irish Style Economic Reforms from an article I had written when I was a graduate student. And as someone who was then a brand new assistant professor, I was thrilled to have my research uh, featured in the Wall Street Journal. And by the way, I would be thrilled as a full professor to continue to have <laughs> research in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but with that introduction, Mary, welcome. Please, come on up. Well, I'll just say that uh, now, am I speaking into this microphone or this microphone, or both of them? Whatever you want. You can okay. walk around if you're on that one. Okay. Um, 
You know, Ben listed these awards I had won, but actually the one that I'm most proud of is that I was named a counter-revolutionary by the uh, uh, dictatorship in Havana. So um, I was told that by some, I was told that by some uh, friends of mine in Miami who, um, who listened to Mesas Rolandas, uh, which is the, the round table that the regime does um, uh, from Havana, I think on a weekly basis, but that's where they named me a counter-revolutionary. Um, okay, so before I get started on Cuba, let me first say how delighted I am to be in Lubbock. Uh, it was so nice to arrive at the airport yesterday. It was so simple, and I went out in like 50 yards out of the airport. I got in my Uber, I went to my hotel. It really did feel a little bit like paradise. Uh, and nobody wearing masks, <laughs> so that was nice. Um, I'm also very glad to be uh, a guest of the Free Market Institute, uh, and I want to congratulate you, Ben, for the work you're doing on the Free Market Institute, because that's not something this text needs. Uh, as Ben mentioned, the America's Column covers uh, political, financial, and economic I I issues in the hemisphere outside of the US. So that includes Canada and 32 other countries in the region. But in the 26 years that I've been at it, I've developed a kind of obsession with one country, and that is Cuba. And I guess the short explanation for that is that while I'm a realist about the human condition and the hunger for power, ever since we got kicked out of the garden, that's been a problem. Um, I also like to think that at some point, at some point, societies pull themselves out of the abyss. You know, there's really such thing as rock bottom. So I look at Cuba, and first, I have to wonder how this incredibly grim reality that we see today overtook what was a relatively prosperous and hopeful nation in the middle of the 20th century. Not only do I wonder how it happened, and I've you know, asked myself this question, I've watched film, I've thought about the history, so I wonder how it happened, but also why Cubans have not been able to right the ship. Why haven't Cubans been able to take back their liberty? Why haven't the mechanisms that ought to check too much power and misery for too long, why have they failed to kick in? On some level, it's really not a puzzle. The Cuban Revolution, which took power in 1959, has excelled at exactly two things. Okay? They have a mess on their hands in terms of the economy, healthcare, education. The place is really a hellhole. But they're very good at two things. Repression and propaganda. And that's how you run a dictatorship for six decades. And if you're on an island, well, that helps too. What may be more important for this crowd to understand is that when you take Cuban history apart, what you find is also a warning to the rest of the world and to the rest of the free world. Cuba had a lot going for it at one time. It wasn't perfect, had a lot of problems, but it had a lot going for it. And so looking back at it, what you have to acknowledge is that freedom is not destiny. It has to be defended and protected and nurtured in every generation. And once it's lost, you're not going to get it back very easily. And when I say defended, I'm not talking about guns. <laughs> okay, Ben told me about that. Does anybody get that joke? Okay. I'm not talking about guns. I'm talking about ideas and moral convictions. As Octavio Paz wrote in the liberal tra tradition, quote, liberty is as precious as water. And like it, if we do not protect it, it spills, escapes us, and disappears. 
It is well documented that when Fidel Castro began telling newspapers in 1959 and 1960 what they could and could not print, editors and publishers resisted. But it was reporters and staff at those very same newspapers and Cuban intellectuals who sided with Castro and went against free speech. To put it in today's vernacular, they engaged in cancel culture. And some of it, by the way, was very violent. Quite obviously, they did not understand the harm they were inflicting even on themselves. But why not? Maybe it was because of a visceral thirst for vengeance against Batista, who was the dictator that Castro unseated. I'll get to more of that in a minute. Maybe their feelings were justified. I mean, they were very angry because Batista had, you know, turned the country upside down and he, he, it was a very repressive environment. But in doing what they did, in siding with Castro and, and using violence against their own org institutions, they committed a kind of national suicide. It's, this is something to bear in mind as we ourselves are living in a cancel culture where there is a thirst for vengeance when it comes to the other side. We have to preserve free thought and free speech and particularly in our universities, in the press, and in the arts. Because all of that was wiped out in Cuba and I think it goes a long way to explaining how the regime dug in so strongly in those early years. Now the title of my talk, which was up there before, is Adios to the Revolution, 62 Years of Cuban Agitprop Down the Drain. Just to be clear, I wrote that on after the July 11th popular uprising on the island. But just to clarify that title, I am by no means saying that I think uh, the regime is going to fall any day. I, I don't think anyone really knows when that will happen or how it will happen. But I do think that something changed on July 11th. And that something was the narrative. The events of July 11th and 12th, sorry, the 11th, the 12th, and to some extent the 13th that went on for a few days, exposed the dictatorship for what it is. And in ways that I think are historic and game changing. When you add that to the fact that Fidel Castro is dead, Raul is sort of on his way out, um, I mean from the world, he's sort of out of government, but he's, he's still <laughs> hovering around. But, um, uh, and that you have a new generation of young people who, when they hear revolution, they either curse <laughs> or they at least at a minimum say, doesn't mean anything to them. They're not inspired by it. They're not uh, fans of it. You know, they, they look around. You know, young people in Cuba, they know that their counterparts in Miami, in Madrid, in Mexico, don't live like they do. They know that they are in a specially uh, horrible place. And so this new generation of Cubans have no respect for authority. It's hard to sustain, given that, that reality, the propaganda that often, one often hears about Cuba, about how Cubans have the government that they want. The fact is that the events of July 11th exposed realities about the repression in Cuba that Americans, or the rest of the world for that matter, rarely ever glimpse, let alone are able to fully grasp. The protests were un precedent. You, you know, if you don't follow Cuba, you may not be able to really appreciate how unprecedented they were. They brought people from all walks of life onto the streets and more importantly across the island. You know, you see these kinds of protests in Havana, but these went from the western end of the island all the way to the eastern end of the island in small towns, in larger towns. That was very important. The other thing that was very important is that you should take note of the coverage, because the coverage in video fashion was also unprecedented. That was largely because of cell phone video. Okay, these were Cubans taking pictures of what was going on, not because of the foreign news bureaus on the island. 
and I'm going to say more about that in a minute, but it's very important. The foreign news bureaus on the island are not a source of truth for the rest of the world, for the Cuban people. They don't do that job because they know, that, you know, if you have a news bureau there, you know very clearly what you are allowed and not allowed to uh, report on and cover. But thanks to the cell phone video, Americans saw the police state in action and also saw the widespread frustration among the population and the courage. I mean, these people were being hauled off to these dungeons where they keep political prisoners. They were being beaten on the street. Not only them, but their whole families. The police would follow their families to their homes and then beat up their children, beat up their their wife, beat up the, an elderly parent. I mean, it was quite a, um, a vicious response to this. And yet, they kept going out. They tried to keep, keep going out on the streets as much as they could. Um, there's something else, too, about this which has geopolitical possibilities. The Cuban government has experienced a collapse of moral justification in the international, uh, on the international stage. If this leads to its demise, it will have enormous implications for the region. And that's because Cuba, aside from being an island slave plantation, is also the nerve center today for the expansion of tyranny in the Western Hemisphere. As we watch individual freedom and institutions that protect it break down in so many fell, uh, frail democracies in Latin America, we need to keep in mind the central role that communist Cuba plays. Venezuela, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, and Peru are all places where Cuban agents have played a very big role in not just in, in the immediate uh, instability, but in indoctrination in universities and schools and um, in, in, in the political um, realm as well. I mean, if you look at a place like Peru, the, basically the intellectual uh, firepower for the new president, who's a Marxist, comes from a guy who can't run because he was, um, he's accused of uh, corruption as a governor of one of, in one of the regions. But he's a guy who is a medical doctor, spent 10 years living in Cuba, and is a true believer. And he's the guy who's running um, the, 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 behind the scenes, the intellectual firepower of the new government in, uh, in Lima. So Cuba provides the intelligence, the networks, the organization, and in the end, the ideas designed to, to topple Republican governance. The liberation of authoritarian regimes in many countries around the region runs right through Havana. So if something, you know, if things change after July 11th, if the moral justification for this regime completely collapses, that will have an implication for the rest of the region. We know that Cuba is a totalitarian police state, and that's important. Totalitarian, not authoritarian. It's totalitarian, it's everything must go through the state. It criminalizes voluntary transactions and free speech. It practices forced abortions. It censors the arts. It forbids ownership of things like boats, very dangerous tool, a boat. Um, it harasses and sometimes jails people who engage in the right to assemble. It murders dissidents. It engages in human trafficking of its medical personnel all over the world so it can earn hard currency it needs to run the repressive machine. Some of those medics have escaped and have told the sto their stories as victims of this large-scale human trafficking operation. Simple tasks like fishing are nearly impossible to do legally in Cuba. Imagine that. You're on an island and you're not allowed to fish. Brilliant. <laughs> the jails are dungeons, the courts are a rubber stamp for the dictator, and there hasn't been a free election in 70 years. <laughs> 70 years. Meanwhile, it's well documented that the ruling elites live lavish lifestyles. For most of them, the last 60, for most of the last 62 years, that elite has been made up of white men in a country that is overwhelmingly black or mixed race. It is not an exaggeration to say that Cuba practices apartheid. 
When European tourism took off in the 1990s, Cubans who by their color and their clothes could be identified reported that they, if they tried to go into hotel lobbies or restaurants, they were evicted and sometimes arrested. Cubans of color who engage in dissent are especially singled out for punishment, very severe punishment. The reason is because the regime's international image is heavily dependent on its claim that it has uplifted the black Cuban. When a black Cuban dares to point out that this isn't true, he must be silenced. And he must be made of an example for other people who might try the same thing. All of this has happened before the eyes of the international community. Yet while the world isolated South Africa for apartheid, it has celebrated, or at a minimum, accepted Cuban repression and its crimes against humanity. President Obama's day at the baseball stadium in Havana with Raul Castro is just one example. Now, it wasn't always like this. In the immediate aftermath of Castro taking power in 1959, the regime was eager to circulate footage of mass executions. And you can still see those black and white film reels. Uh, this terror was crucial in creating the fear necessary to put down dissent and paralyze opposition. Soon enough, though, Castro realized that those newsreels were not good PR for him outside Cuba. Thereafter, journalists were expelled and Castro established an internal blockade of information. The missile crisis in 1962 was also a time of bad PR for the island because it revealed Cuba's close relationship with the Soviet Union. But aside from those two moments in time, Cuba has managed to impose a news blackout, leaving Americans largely uninformed or misinformed about the realities of the dictatorship. This has allowed Cuba to write and publish its own narrative for six decades. And it's not in my speech, but I'll just mention right now. Evidence of that is the idiots you see wearing Che Guevara t-shirts. <laughs> I mean, this guy was uh, a very hateful, vindictive person who was also a moralizer. He was always telling other people how they should live. I mean, most young people who are wearing this t-shirt would not survive a half an hour with Che Guevara. And yet, after he was killed in Bolivia, Fidel Castro converted him into this kind of saintly figure. And look at all the you know, useful idiots in this country who bought into it. They know nothing about the history of Che Guevara or the revolution. From time to time, there have been cracks in the wall of silence that Castro imposed. When Armando Valladares was finally released after 22 years in prison, he published his memoir. Uh, which was titled Against All Hope. I recommend it to you if you're interested in uh, what life in a Cuban prison is like. Ronald Reagan raised his visibility by making him the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Human Rights Commission. Another memorable exception is the film called Before Night Falls about the life of Reynaldo Arenas. But these revelations always seemed to me a drop in the bucket compared to the power of Hollywood and much of the media to glamorize Castro, much in the same way that Walter Durante at the New York Times and FDR economist Rex Tugwell glamorized the Soviet Union. By the way, if you haven't seen the film Mr. Jones about the Welsh journalist who exposed the Soviet starvation of the Ukraine, I, I highly recommend it. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, it's, it's kind of stomach turning, but it's, it's really an education. Fidel understood the power of his literary program and all the other socialist ideas he had. After all, he was helping the poor. And the exiles arriving in Miami were largely from the urban bourgeois class. But I think it's worthwhile to just take a few minutes to set the record straight about the revolution because most Americans know very little about Cuban history. And I want to say something about pre-revolutionary Cuba. I mentioned before that, you know, things weren't so bad in Cuba. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples that might be helpful. Again, I want to stress that 
It was not perfect. There were a lot of problems. But there were a lot of problems in the U.S., I mean, racial problems in the U.S. in the, in the late 50s in parts of the U.S. So, um, you know, we look back today at the situation in Cuba in 1959. You could be horrified about it, but you have to take it in the context of the history of where Cuba was at the time. Part of the narrative written by the communists is that pre-revolutionary Cuba was extremely poor and backward. And this is a complete distortion of history. First, let's remember that when the revolution triumphed, Cuba was an independent country for only 57 years. Okay? It had gotten its independence in 1902. So that's a very young nation. The 1940 Constitution is a reasonably sound document. Although, you know, it is uh, a pocketbook version of it is 130 pages. I would argue that that's uh, way too complex. But it put the country on the path to Republican governance. Cuban culture doesn't seem to have been ready for it. And when I say that, I'm referring again to intellectuals, uh, those people that I mentioned before who were very eager to see Castro end free speech. The institutions that that document had created didn't have the time to develop or to sort of lock in any kind of stability. Batista, who had been elected president from 1940 to 1944, seized power illegitimately in 1952, and that was sort of the end of the Constitution for that time. But it's not true that Cuba was economically backward. That's just not true. A US presence in Cuba four years after Spain was defeated in 1898 is often, sorry, Spain was defeated in 1898 and the US had a presence in Cuba until 1902. So that's all often criticized as being colonialism. But that relationship with the US set Cuba on a path toward development. An article published by PBS, Public uh, Broadcasting, titled Pre-Castro Cuba and written for the 2005 American Experience documentary on Fidel Castro reported that by 1958 Cuba was, quote, the third richest country in per capita GDP in Latin America, third in life expectancy, second in per capita ownership of cars and telephones, first in the number of television sets. Maybe that was the problem. <laughs> uh, and then further quoting from this same piece, which you can find on the web. The literacy rate, 76%, was the fourth highest in Latin America. Cuba ranked 11th in the, wor in the world in the number of doctors per capita. Many private clinics and hospitals provided services for the poor. Cuba's income distribution compared favorably with that of other Latin American societies. A thriving middle class held the promise of prosperity and social mobility. Close quote. So what about the poverty and racial inequity that we hear so much about? It was there, of course. But as I mentioned before, it was also a fact of life in much of the southern United States at that time. And it's important to keep in mind that as we revisit Cuban history and the desperate search for justification for, uh, for the repression, th it's important to keep this uh, historical context in mind. On the education front, we often hear that, well, okay, the revolution, eh, maybe it wasn't, maybe it hasn't been quite what it was cracked up to be. But Cuba has done well in health and education. <laughs> Colin Powell, the George Bush's Secretary of State, made that point when he was Secretary of State. The facts don't support that assertion. First, Many countries in Latin America had much lower literacy rates in 1959. And almost all of them now have literacy rates well into the 90% range. Which from that I conclude that you don't need to lock people in dungeons and to, to impose this level of repression and strip people of their property and all of their rights in order to get high rates of literacy. 
Who could possibly defend that? It's insane. And yet it's repeated over and over again. Also, why would you bring, why would you brag about an educated population when the population is not allowed to read freely? I mean, what, what use is, that, uh, is literacy when, you know, there's like five books you can read and they all have to be approved by the state? Getting back to the legitimate issues of the disparity that existed in 1959, the PBS documentary quotes the Latin American historian and analyst Mark Falkoff, who uh, may be retired at this point, but he's, he was an excellent analyst. And he wrote the following about this inequity that existed in Cuba. One might best summarize the complex situation by saying that urban Cuba had come to resemble a southern European country, parentheses, with a standard of living as high or surpassing that of France, Spain, Portugal, and Greece, close parentheses, while rural Cuba replicated the conditions of other plantation societies and Latin, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So the poverty and the, the great inequities were related to the campo, to the, the rural area, um, but the urban areas were actually quite developed. Um, now this is interesting because Batista was not overthrown by those poor people. Batista was overthrown, it was a, uh, an upper class uh, and middle class event, and it was a rebellion against corruption and repression. The repression, uh, it was not bad economic conditions that drove this uh, re revolution. The 26th of July movement, which Fidel Castro headed, was made up largely of Cubans who sought to restore the Constitutional Republic. I know a lot of them. They're old, they live in Miami, and they talk about how they really believed when they were in the mountains with Fidel or, or doing the urban kind of guerrilla work, they believed they were going to restore the 1940 Constitution. When Castro hijacked it and refused to hold elections, thousands of Cubans went back into the mountains to try to overthrow him, and they also went to Guatemala to train for the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. Over the years, and I would bet a lot of money, I don't know how much exactly, but <laughs> that most people in here have, have, are not familiar with the uprising in the Escambray Mountains. It was, it was the center of counter-revolutionary activity. I've interviewed tenant farmers who were part of that effort to defeat communism. It's a very interesting uh, historical uh, fact that while the urban elite, the upper middle class, many of them were backing Castro, these people, the Guajiros from the center of the, from central Cuba who were farmers, tenant farmers, they said, we do not want to live under communism. You know, communism is a very, uh, it's good for, it, it, it sells to urban factory workers, but it doesn't sell so well in, in rural areas, because in rural areas, people want to have their, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's a sign for guns. <laughs> um, but, you know, people want more uh, autonomy over their lives. They're used to that and those demands. So um, that's where the re a lot of the rebellion came. Uh, it took Castro some six years to defeat the uprising in the Escambray. And again, practicing sophisticated methods of propaganda. He called them bandits and he used his bully pulpit to discredit them inside and outside of Cuba. But they were popular in central Cuba where small tenant farmers and peasants wanted nothing to do with communism. And it's very unlikely, I bet this is another fact you don't know, it is very unlikely that he would have defeated them without the help of the Soviets, who sent hundreds of advisors to the Escambray to, and, and to central Cuba to cleanse the, mountain, uh, the mountains and central Cuba of peasant families who were supporting the rebels. The cleansing was harsh. Families were physically moved from into concentration camps on the western end of the island. There's a town there called Sandino. Any guesses what that's about? 
Um, and, uh, and, they, and they were put there, forced to live there. They were moved there physically and forced to live there because he knew that the peasant families were the ones who were feeding the rebels. Uh, I interviewed a Wahiro. He passed away last year, but he was a wonderful guy. He came from a very poor family in, in central Cuba. Uh, and he told me about his experience. He actually wrote a book. He had been cutting sugar cane since he was six years old. He said he was so small that his older brothers had to throw the cane up on the cart for him. When he was 19, Castro came to power. He was married. He had a baby daughter. He had built himself a, a, a casita. And he believed he was going places. I mean, he believed he had agency. He had, a, he had ideas for his life. He told me how when uh, the very first sugarcane plantation that Castro sees was where was the one sugar plantation that was the best employer in the region. The owners paid well, they treated their employees well, and they were very well liked. And he and other families took up arms to oppose communism. This guy was actually shot in the hip, uh, taken prisoner, and uh, spent 26 years in a Cuban prison. I asked him, since Castro was promising to take from the rich and give to the poor, and you were the poor, why were you against that? And he said to me, I still remember this, he said, I looked at that and I thought to myself, if he can do that to them, what chance do I have? You know, common sense is, not everybody is born with it, but I mean, this guy understood at a very visceral level what communism meant to him and his family and his dreams. And um, so going back to where I started with my obsession about what happened to Cuba, I still don't know how it happened and why Cubans haven't been able to extricate themselves from this nightmare. But I do know that while educated middle class Cubans were cheering on Castro, Guajiros from central Cuba risk all they had to try to defeat him. And there's something in that that we need to understand. Um, two more points. Um, I wanted to make this a lot about questions and uh, conversation, but I'll just make two more points. I'm not, I meant to time myself and I forgot, so. Um, those who believe in freedom will often say that, well, we should have more open relations with Cuba. In that way, we would expose the regime. And I mean, I consider myself a classical liberal, and I really wish I could be more enthusiastic about that. But there is no evidence that that strategy would work. Uh, I mentioned before about the foreign news organizations. The Journal did not open a bureau in Cuba. And I think you know, the reason was because we didn't want to be reporting under the rules of Fidel Castro. When foreign news organizations were permitted to open bureaus on the island, the regime has used them as propaganda outlets. You can see that on CNN any night of the week. Um, there's a, sp sorry. Uh, the Spanish journalist Vicente Botín, who worked for state television in Spain and was sent to Cuba for four years. And uh, uh, after those four years, he, he wrote a book about it. And I've, I've become friends with him and talked to him on some occasions. But he said uh, the, the, the repression for the journalists was intense. I mean, there were things you couldn't cover, and there were places you couldn't go. I mean, you were really very much limited to Havana. If you wanted to go somewhere else, you needed all kinds of government permission and, uh, and all of that. So any journalist who goes to Cuba knows that if they want to go back, they need to sing the right tune, which could explain why I'm not allowed to go back. <laughs> um, I did go in 1998, but um, uh, so I don't know how I'm doing on time here. How much more time do I have? Five minutes left. Okay, Total. so let me, okay, there are 15 minutes left and I want to have time for questions, so I want to recommend a book to you if you're really interested in what happens when you open, when you get businesses can go to Cuba. There's a book called Close But No Cigar by Stephen Purvis. And he's a Brit who went to Cuba um, as an architect. He worked very closely with the regime. He was, you know, building hotels and golf courses and helping them build their tourism infrastructure. And one day, 
he got taken away. Um, when I heard about it, I sort of thought, well, I guess he gets what he deserves. But actually, after I read the book, I felt sorry for him because I sort of pictured that he was in a room with like a little twin bed and a table with a lamp and they wouldn't let him out. I mean, he was in Via Marista, which is the worst prison on the island, I think, or one of the worst. I guess there's a lot of competition for that. For eight months and another year at Condesa. Um, and the reason was because they just decided that they wanted to take back the business and, you know, they wanted to get rid of him. So they started accusing him. It's really a nightmare. And I mean, this didn't happen in 1973, okay? This, <laughs> this happened in the 2000s. So it gives you some idea of the potential for, you know, businesses to operate, farm businesses to operate in Cuba. I mean, it's kind of insane. Anyway. Um, just one last point, which is I don't think, you know, quite obviously the regime is not going to give up easily. And they're doing two things right now. They've increased the repression. I could talk a little bit more about that. They're going house to house, doing investigations, writing down what the politics of the, of the uh, occupants are, who they are, how many people live there, and so forth. Hundreds, if not thousands, of political prisoners are now being held. Um, they're also ramping up their international um, image. Uh, <laughs> Makeover. Uh, the dictator was in Mexico yesterday for the independent as a guest of the president of Mexico. Um, the cardinal from uh, from Boston was recently was there just last week doing photo ops with with the dictator and the other terrorists that run the island. So they're also going to make a very uh, they're going to blitz in terms of the um, their international image and and try to get themselves out of this hole. I think what happened on July 11th. We, we, we can't lose that. We have to keep reminding people of that because it exposed uh, the realities of Cuba. And I'll stop there and give a chance to ask, uh, answer questions.